This is the first act with a, of a film with a typical three-act structure. It has a protagonist. It has a... Not everyone here has that same model, but many of you do. And many of you have models in which you will have first act, second act, and third act within the structure of your little modules. But in every film, there has to be this first act material. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the first act material comes first. It's just first act material. And the, the conformist, Bertolucci's conformist, starts with the act three. And uh, Harold Pinter's The Betrayal starts at the end. But all of these films, every film that, that is successful must have this first act material. If it doesn't, then we don't know where the character starts from in order to begin their journey, their dramatic journey. So this is, this is uh, and this, some of this first act material may be folded in into second act, or, in, or it may come, come later. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be locked into a chronological unfolding of the material, but it must be there to give you a chance to engage the audience. Uh, this is my little analogy. This is your film. And to engage an audience, <coughs> You don't just give them the film. What you do is you unfold the film. And you look at this, hopefully, with anticipation, expectation, fear, hope. So you keep going. <coughs> ladling it out and controlling and organizing the action. Not just within acts, so you, you organize the action within acts, you organize the action within sequences, you organize the action within scenes, and within scenes you also organize the action into smaller blocks. We all have a mass of material, we have characters, we have this, we have events and circumstances, but how do we organize this and how do we begin? Uh, okay, so first act. You introduce your characters, you introduce your circumstance, you introduce the dilemma that your protagonist is in. And at the end of the first act, we should be aware of the dilemma that the character faces. They start off with ordinary life. This lady here starts off with ordinary life, Irma. She's a character in this film. Uh, ordinary life, there is an inciting incident that changes that life. She was one thing one day, and now there are new possibilities enter her life. Just a small thing. And it changes her life forever. This is a very, very simple uh, film, and yet it's very rich. It's got two storylines going, two conflicts. There's the external conflict, which becomes evident before the end of the first act, and it has a secondary conflict, which also becomes evident at the end of the uh, first act. This film is much larger than it appears. And this is what I was talking about yesterday in the class, about trying to make your film larger than what your story is. This is a film about hubris. A woman trying to go beyond the restrictions of her society and of her culture. But we're not going to see the whole film, but I think by the end of the first act, we will know where this film is going. This is one of the great performances on film. And this is a performance in which the Seemingly, this actress does nothing. It's, she hardly moves. It's fantastic. What, this is a great lesson for all the screenwriters and directors about what the camera can do. So, while we're watching this, we're going to watch basically action 
we're going to see the character is action. Every character in this film is depicted through their action. And we're going to, and, and what we get from each character, especially Irmo, is an equation. First we see Irmo's, what she does for work. Then we see Irmo's relationship to her husband. Then we see Irmo's relationship to her dream. For, no, to her neighbor, then her dream. And so we get this equation of Irmo. We don't get it all at once. Boom, boom, boom. And by the end of the first act, we understand who Irmo is. We understand her relationship with the husband, with the neighbor, and with her dream. Uh, and all of this is done through action. The film never just stops and tells you, well, we're in China now, and they live here, and this, and this is the problem with the money, and blah, 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 blah. We just get it through what she does. Um, okay, we're just gonna, I'm going to stop this from time to time. You're going to see this action of this first act arranged in sequences. And first of all, they're going to set up Irmo, uh, her job, her relationship to her neighbor, to her community, to her husband. Uh, and we're going to start, even in the first 10 minutes, we're going to start to smell a little bit of who this person is. We're going to understand so much about her, just in who she married, uh, to begin with, and who she married, this is very interesting, about how we get all of this backstory without the film ever stopping. We understand completely who she married, why she married, what went wrong, and the film just keeps going. One thing as a screenwriter we should realize, directors too, but screenwriters, when we start to write, how much information is available to the audience in background? You know, we, we, some of these stories that we hear presented are just, we just get, they get sunk with all this background material. This background material doesn't really help the story move forward. It's just a fact. Yes, it's an important fact. But as screenwriters, what we want to be able to do is realize the power of the camera. You know, image is worth a thousand words. So that you'll see how much background how much stuff in the background, how much stuff in the costume, how much stuff we get from information, expository information from just the geography. Uh, the geography of this place is set up through action, one of the things we have to do. The relationship of Irmo's house to the neighbor's house, the relationship of Irmo's village to the city. All of these things are set up through action, so I think we'll just start it right now. Again, this idea of it, it, it unfolding, we don't just hand them something, the audience. They Hopefully, they will sit there and watch it unfold and will start to anticipate the next thing. And what we want to do as screenwriters and directors later on is to continually raise questions about what will happen next. And the biggest question we're going to face uh, is at the end of this first act, when everything is in place, we understand all of these dynamics, and we wonder, we understand why we're watching the movie, and we're going to, under, we, we, we want to know, and we understand, even if we don't phrase it consciously, we understand in our stomach, our viscera, we understand what we are rooting for, what we want to happen, what we hope will happen, and what we fear might happen. Everyone has a separate entrance into the film. First, Irma, then her neighbor, the neighbor's truck, which plays a very important role here, but we start to get it without us even realizing we're getting this information. We want the narrator to go away from our main character, like here. Irmo is going on the truck, but the camera stays in the village with the chief and the blind man's wife. If we want to do that, if we need to do that to tell our story, we have to set that up in the first act. 
We don't want to wait until sometime in the second act to go away from our main character. We should be looking for these transitions. I, would hope, I was going to do a whole thing on transitions, but we just don't have time. But the, what, from going from one scene to the next scene, the what that happens between scenes, the contrast, the narrative thrust, is all it's something that can energize a script. So she's starting to get dressed. We don't see a. We interrupt an action and go right into the middle of an, another action, and we is an energizing moment there where we just get thrust ahead so that the narrative thrust keeps moving even in these very ordinary uh, actions. So we have these dramatic blocks, and each of them contain actions. Now I've got like about 50 actions here. You know, actors act, and actors have beats. You know, I do. So in this, I, let me just, you don't have to know. I have actions for the actors here to delay, to draw out, to accuse, uh, to protest, to announce, to question, to confirm, to explain, to imply, to deny, to inform, to state, to explain, to inquire, to disclose, to detach, to distance. All of these things, nobody, in other words, when I move away from you, I'm detaching myself, perhaps. If I move closer to you, I may be threatening you, I may be seducing you. We must find the action here, and you must find the action for your, for your dialogue. Every piece of dialogue here contains an action. Now, we have all of these here, I don't know, 50, say, acting beats. And uh, uh, if they're just random, you know, all floating around, it's hard to, to get a forward momentum. So what we want to do is organize these. And this is what the dramatic blocks do. You know, when I was thinking about how to explain directing to people, this came up, because how do you organize things? Well, but basically I realized that uh, it's very helpful for writing to understand this. Anytime you can figure out a way to arrange these patterns. Now, it's not, writing is not as me mechanistic as this. And it's got nothing to do with what Lewis was talking about the other day, about finding your story. And all, you know, the story is separate from writing a screenplay. And when you, this here is when you're not going to be doing this for a while. Okay. Now, at the end of the third dramatic block is what I call a fulcrum. You know what a fulcrum is? A fulcrum is like a, you know, you put a seesaw on a fulcrum and it goes like this. The fulcrum doesn't move. The point at which nothing moves. Now, you could call, in, in a film, you know, you have a turning point. But a turning point is a wider radius. What I'm trying to imply when I say fulcrum is that action comes to a stop in the scene, dramatic scene. In other words, our protagonist wants something. The fulcrum is the point in the scene where she will either get it or be defeated. For me, it's just a sharp point. And it, it's just a sharp point, and in my mind, it just means something that, for a, even if it's an instant, what, what its function is that the audience raises a question at this point. And that's the key, that's its function. The function is for the audience to raise a question. So, there is the three blocks, and each one you'll see has a geographical uh, place in this small patio. Uh, actually, this is more than one scene. It starts in the kitchen, and he comes in. Another thing that we want to do as screenwriters is to set up uh, the, ge the geography of a location. Because geography is exposition. Every time I see a room, ah, oh, they can see the sea. Oh, nice. If, that, if a dramatic scene is going on, and I'm interested in the sea or the couch, then it intrudes on the scene, you see. So you'll see, Hitchcock does this a lot, you'll see, uh, uh, well, a lot of directors do it. They set up the geography before, and the writer has to know about this. So they, they set up the scene that took place earlier here. It didn't have to take place there. It took place there partly to set up the exposition of the geography for this place. So that when he comes in now, he comes in in a familiar image. He comes in with the same movement that we saw earlier. We see the connection 
of the living room to the patio. And we see the French, and it reintroduces the French doors to us that has a payoff at the end of the film. So when writing a screenplay, when all is said and done, we then have to go back and do some of this mechanical work, which a lot of us lead to the directors. Yeah, they got to do it. But if we can be aware of these things, you know, uh, it's helpful uh, to know that we're setting up some, we're setting up this space, just like um, uh, the, the, the Chinese film with Irmo, we start to see the geography of the town, so that the drama now can unfold without the exposition of who lives next to who. Uh, the space is familiar with us, we're comfortable in this universe. Interesting characters never lose their wants until they're really defeated. So at this moment, even though it's very fast, we feel a question mark. Is she going to stand for this? I mean, because he's pretty adamant. But no matter how adamant the antagonist is, a character's want is always greater. The character's want has to be bludgeoned to death. Characters have only two dramatic movements towards one another. They are apart and they go together, they're together and they go apart. So here, they were together at the beginning, and at the end, they're the fir as far away as possible within this uh, geography. So this is, again, if we understand what the director is going to add to our screenplay, we can start to help the director. And we can start to create scenes that are really film scenes, and are, that are more than just writing. We create scenes that take place in time, and we create scenes that take place in space. Uh, now, people have said in the class over the last four days, well, how can they do, how can the person, I can't, they can't move that fast. You know, I can't get them to this point that fast. Right? Somebody is here, and how do you get them here, psychologically? Well, how do we do that? Okay. There are ways to do that in film. In fact, we've got to do that in film. Now, in, L in this film, you may or may not be familiar with it, there are two very unlikely people who hate each other for, uh, on this island, a man and a woman. And uh, the, the, I'll just set it up briefly, is that, uh, that the woman, the job that, that the screenwriter needs to do here is to get the woman to accept the man as her ruler. Two things have to happen in this film. One, this lady has to move towards him. Two, he has to move towards her. But they do it one at a time. But still you're faced with the problem of how do you make her <clears throat> kiss his feet at the end of this scene, sequence. How do you get that, how do you make the audience believe that? You create the atmosphere for romance to happen. I was going to show, show you a shorter scene in Jaws. It's the same kind of movement. Before the first time they put the harpoon in the shark, the whole reason for that scene is for the captain and the marine biologist to move closer together, leaving the sheriff alone. So through the fire, the battle, they become closer together, but they still don't like one another. So, it can't all happen in one scene. So, Spielberg does this very nice little atmospheric scene before, after they put the harpoon in the shark, and before they go in for the drinking inside, where they become fast friends, and they put, actually end up physically together. To make it believable, Spielberg creates an atmosphere with music and with the darkening night and with a series of shots he creates an atmosphere in which the next scene can happen. Here's the same thing. Uh, he, this is a, wonderfully, uh, a wonderful example of an atmospheric, I call a lyrical se sequence. It's not dramatic, but it takes, it, it, takes it, it has a real dramatic job to do is to take this woman to a certain psychological place. And actually, I think if you saw the film in its entirety, you would believe it. But you, it would have taken too long to get there any other way. 
this is the most, probably the most important thing today besides this idea of action and how we arrange action, is the idea of film time. This is the hardest thing for writers to do. There's three kinds of time. Actually, there's four kinds of time in film. One of them is real time. You, you track with me as I walk to the window, that's real time. Then there's compression. Compression is used to cut out all the boring stuff. I come in from the rain, I've got galoshes, a raincoat, an umbrella. You know, you read screenplays, he comes in with, rock, with, with a raincoat and galoshes. He takes off his raincoat, he puts his galoshes. So what we have to do, you know, is be able to realize what editing can do and how we can use this time uh, to compress. Uh, we can build a birdhouse in 30 seconds. A woman can put on, a, or a man, can put on their makeup in 30 seconds. They can do the whole job. So we can, comp we can use this, we understand this idea of compression, and that's not too hard. We also may understand the idea of elaboration, in which we take something and make it larger. A good example is at the end of Notorious, that's the classical elaboration sequence. If you remember that, walking down the stairs, it's 40 shots just to get down the steps. So you take this and you make it longer through shots. Now this is, a, this is important for the screenwriter to know, and if but the screenwriter doesn't do that, the director will take care of it. But we should know that. But the hardest thing for the creation of the script itself is film time. Film time is, is, is the approximation of real time. The audience thinks it's real time, they react to it, they react to it as real time, and yet there are significant portions cut out. <laughs> the idea of people who are apart and coming together. At the beginning of this film, these people couldn't be in the two different universes. And the writer or Wertmuller uh, do two things here. They explore the island to set up all the different uh, topography of the island. There's cliffs, there's uh, tidal pools, there's this, there's that. So that these things later on will be available for the director to use, or for the screenwriter to... But he, so we explore the island at the same time the distance between these two people is made manifest palpably, physically. Then, I'm gonna, we're going to cut right to the end of the second act, and we will see how the director shows this closure in which these two people are now entwined uh, together. You couldn't get a pencil between. The question that was raised, what's going to happen to these people once they get on the island, has been answered. They get married. And if you saw the film from the beginning, you would never believe that you could get this character to do this. It's a huge movement here. And many of us at this point are afraid to have these huge movements in our characters. We're afraid to get them to go this fantastic difference because we say, oh, it won't be believable. Nobody could go that far. This is where we have, we have to go far.